What a great hymn of the faith. A mighty fortress is our God. Let's go ahead and stand. And we're going to actually sing that song as a congregation. Let's stand, stand and sing. Seek to work us woe. 
Amen. You may be seated. Amen. Mighty Fortress is our God. I'm telling you, that song rings true this week uh, for all of us who were close to Jim Miller and just the shock that that has been. If you did not know, if you don't, maybe if you're not on Facebook, um, Jim Miller passed into the arms of his Lord and Savior and to be with his wife Friday um, at 1.30 a.m. And uh, it's been a very bittersweet week for me. That was uh, very bitter. Um, I saw him going downhill as the family kept me updated. They didn't think that this was going to be the case. The doctors thought he was going to make a full recovery last week, and, and, and he just went downhill. And with every new information that I got, my heart just broke, and I started to pray more and more for a miracle. And um, was hoping, hoping for a miracle. And, and it just was so devastating when I got the call from, from Josh on Thursday that uh, he wasn't going to make it. But you know, God has ways of getting us through. And I know that as I've talked with the family, the Lord is getting them through. The body they may kill, but God's truth abideth still. His kingdom is forever. And that is what Jim is experiencing now. His kingdom is forever. What a blessed man, a sweet man. I thank the Lord for 68 years he gave to so many people of Jim Miller. And uh, my kids, when I told them about Jim passing, they were devastated because he was their Sunday school teacher and their Awana leader. Um, Here's a man who served with kids, even though all his kids are grown and he's still serving. Um, He served in so many ways in this church. And... um, We all feel a a great void. It was a great loss to this church um, and to his family. Uh, His smile, constantly contagious smile. We're going to miss him uh, desperately. And what I was saying was right when I was talking to Josh on the phone, the Lord helped me get through that because I was hoping and praying for a miracle. And then sometimes when that doesn't happen, it's like, God, why? 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 I mean, I want guys like Jim all the way into their 90s. You know, he's a soldier for the kingdom. I, I, I want him here. Lord, why? You know, and, and, uh, and yet during, right when I got that call, and I'm talking to Josh, I'm getting a call from my dad, calls me three times when I'm talking to Josh, and I just, come on, dad. You know, he just keeps calling me, and finally when I got off the phone with Josh, I called my dad up, and he's, in him telling me through tears, he said, I'm cancer-free. They got, the, they got the news from the doctors that he's cancer-free. And so you talk about, amen, all praise to the Lord, but you talk about bittersweet. It was like the Lord knew that I needed to hear it just in that moment. And, you know, you have to have spiritual eyes to see what God is doing in the midst of devastation. You've got to say, Lord, what are you doing? How, do you, how are you getting me through? Um, as a pastor, it's like I've done 20, now I think 28 funerals at least since I've been here. And it's just, it's each one, it just is m- more difficult for me because usually it's like the longer I have with that person um, as I am here longer. But uh, the Lord uh, brought me through. And that my dad said, he said, the doctor told me, he said, I have never seen someone with your cancer in the stage that was in beat it. I've never seen it. So it's just absolute miracle. Why does God answer some and not others? I will only know when I get to glory, probably. Um, But um, I wanted to let you know, church, I hope that you can make this happen. I know that it's hard sometimes in the middle of the week for people to make it if they've got work, but I really hope that you can make his service. Uh, Jim was an awesome man of God who um, was so dedicated here, and I, I want us to, to um, honor his life, and, and I hope you can make it to his service. It is this Tuesday, June 1st. Um, the visitation is at 10 a.m. at Dustin and Wyckoff in Mount Zion, and the service is at 12 o'clock, so noon. So I hope to see you there if you can make it and arrange your schedule to be there for that. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, We do declare that you are a mighty fortress. In the midst of 
the attacks from the enemy that we have in this world, a, a mighty enemy that is stronger than us, Lord, we, we, we s- declare that you are mightier still, that you have overcome and that you will win the war, the battle in the end. And we praise you for serving a resurrected, risen Lord who has conquered death. Lord, may uh, you comfort the family with uh, that fact during this time. We know that Jim, I don't know if he's riding motorcycle up there, but if he is, it's on more beautiful streets. So Lord, uh, we look forward to seeing him again someday. And um, we just thank you for your love, Lord. That fact that that is appointed for all of us to die and then to face judgment. But Lord, I thank you that because of your son shedding your blood on that cross, Lord, that we are confident that Jim is with you. And Lord, doesn't, we don't have to fear that judgment either because of what you have done for us. In your name we pray, amen. With Memorial Day here, um, I'd like it if any of you have lost a loved one in fighting for the freedoms that we enjoy here in America, um, if you could stand for just a second. I think that we have some that have lost a loved one. Thank you so much, you guys. Thank you so much for the sacrifice that you made, um, and of course, your loved one passing away. and. We just pray for you. You're in our hearts um, as we celebrate the freedoms that we have today. So um, let's, uh, I want to just have a moment of silence as we think of those who have given their lives for our country, for the freedoms that we have. Um, I don't know about you, but I like to, to get in the spirit to watch some kind of war movie or something, you know, that deals with World War II. And then you just go, look at the sacrifice that was made 
for the peace that we have. So I just think about that and think about the sacrifice that was made, those who, um, who, who gave their lives for us to have the freedom that we have and the, the peace and that we can worship the Lord without worrying about people um, coming in and keeping us from doing that. So um, let us have just a moment of silence for those who have passed. Lord, we do live in a beautiful country. Whenever I read the Old Testament and how the, your people were going into the land flowing of milk and honey, I think of America. I think of how blessed we are and how easy it is to take that for granted. Lord, I've been in other parts of the world and there's a lot of darkness. And there's darkness here in America because of sin, but Lord, it truly is a country full of light. And... Uh, we thank you for the peace that we have here in America and for the freedoms that we enjoy. And Lord, I pray that you would comfort especially those who have lost loved ones fighting for those freedoms. Help us to remember to never take them for granted for there has been a cost that has been paid for those freedoms. In your name, amen. Let's stand as we continue to worship and sing, Is He Worthy? Do you feel the world is broken? We do. Do you feel the shadows deepen? We do. But do you know that all the dark won't stop the light from getting through we do and do you wish that you could see it all made new we do is all creation groaning and is a new creation coming Is the glory of the Lord to be the light within our midst? And is it good that we remind ourselves of this? Is anyone worthy? Is anyone whole? Is anyone able to break the seal and open the scroll? The Lion of Judah, who conquered the grave. He is David's root and the Lamb who died to ransom the slave. Is he worthy? Is he worthy of all blessing and honor and glory? Is he worthy of this? He is. Does the Father truly love us? And does the Spirit move among us? And is Jesus our Messiah? Oh, forever those he loves. Does our God intend to dwell again with us? Is anyone worthy? Is anyone whole? Is anyone able to break the sea? the grave. He is David's root and the Lamb who 
Travis saw my outline this morning, actually it was, I think it was last night, he said, I've got money that this is going to go over, so we'll see. Um, got a lot here to deal with this morning, and uh, if we go over, uh, I want to remind you that our service used to be an hour and 15 minutes, okay, so <laughs> we're only an hour now, all right? So um, we may go over some today, uh, but... This topic is such a huge topic, and if you know, last Sunday it was um, Marriage and Divorce Part 1. We're now in Marriage and Divorce Part 2. This morning is focused on what Jesus says about marriage, divorce, and remarriage. Uh, Last Sunday was what Paul says about this topic. Um, And so, uh, first I want to get into 1 Corinthians 7 just as a reminder of what we dealt with last Sunday, Um, but before I do that... Uh, I'd like to just pray. So let's pray. Father, I pray that uh, you would help me handle these texts accurately. Lord, that um, you would interpret them the way that they were meant to be interpreted. And Lord, that, that we would apply them to our lives in a way that honors you and glorifies you. So Lord, be with us this morning and may uh, your will be accomplished. In your name, amen. Uh, a while back... I had a girl in my youth group when I was picking up a bunch of kids for youth group, uh, former church that I was at. She said, please turn that song off. It was a song um, called Remember When. I don't know if you've heard of that song. Remember when 30 seems so old. You know, you heard that song. Beautiful song. I love that song. And I said, why? Why don't you? She said, that was the song that was played at my parents' wedding. And she said, it just... I can't listen to it because their parents got divorced. Um, you know, I'll never forget her sharing that with me. And the trauma that divorce brings in someone's life, um, the broken relationship that it is. I feel like if life were a basketball game, the goal being to glorify God in life, the offense and defensive strategy of how to do that would probably be at its, gra- at its foundational levels, the family. The family. Jesus said that it, they will know us by our love for one another. How we love each other in our families. And you guys, I- I'm getting tired of getting our tails kicked. I don't know about you guys. I'm too competitive for this. Especially on, on my watch. When I'm, when I'm a pastor and serving in the church, I'm just tired of this issue of divorce just beating us. We feel like we're losing the battle. Divorce rate has skyrocketed over the years. On top of it, now we are reinterpreting marriage. I just saw an ad recently. It had like this picture of three men, I think it was, and like one woman all dressed up perfectly with their two little children, and it was saying the new family. And it looked so perfect and pretty. And it reminded me as I was thinking about that, you know, we're losing the battle. And I'm like, who are we losing to? We're losing to jokes. I mean, if you think about it, that's a joke. Are you serious? That's what we're losing the battle to? Uh, You know, I'm thinking about, when I played basketball in college, we played one team 
um, called Emmaus Bible School in Iowa. And it was um, a small little school. I don't think it exists anymore. And we were way better than them. We had beaten inner city schools, much more talented. And we went to this school, and we were getting beaten. I don't remember who won the game, but I remember just going, how was this happening? And they were just, they were very physical, and they would foul a lot, and the refs would just kind of not call the fouls. And you're like, what is going on? And I feel like that's how it is in our culture today. It's like those in power, you know, who have, calling the shots are just silent. Or they're, or they're calling the wrong calls. And we're like, why are we losing? And it's just devastating. Today, you know, tomorrow is Memorial Day. We're going to be celebrating that. You want to know how to fight for our country? Fight at home. Fight in your families. Fight to love your spouse well. Fight to raise kids that know and love Jesus. If you're not married, be a good support to those who are. It is a battle, and the enemy is having a heyday in America. Last Sunday, we talked about 1 Corinthians 7. I just want to give you some overview of that. Um, 1 Corinthians 7 holds up a strong commitment to marriage. Even in the hardest of circumstances, even when someone was married to an unbeliever, you had the Corinthian church is, is, is growing, and you have a lot of people coming to know Christ who are now married to unbelievers. And you have people who have been divorced probably multiple times because that's what was so popular in that culture. Divorced multiple times, now becoming Christians, and they're going, should we just not get married now? What should we do? And so Paul does a good job of holding up the strong commitment to marriage. He says, listen, the whole point of you staying married to an unbeliever is to win them for Christ, which brings about one of the big purposes of marriage, and that is the spiritual transformation of one another. My goal is to help Heidi become more like Jesus, and her goal is to help me become more like Jesus. That's our main goal. So that's what he's talking about here. And he says, don't separate, don't leave your spouse just because it's tough. They may nag you about giving to the church or tithing, or they may nag you about, oh, you're all self-righteous now. But no, you stick with them and love them like Christ loved you. So it holds up a strong commitment to marriage, even when it's very, very difficult. But it also deals with some issues. It gives allowance to those who have been abandoned to get married. In verse 8, he says, it is not a sin. And he's talking about the unmarried person. That's a key word in 1 Corinthians 7. They have, he, he mentions virgin, he mentions unmarried, and he mentions widowed. So the unmarried person, from what most many scholars believe, was someone who was formally married, especially in Corinth, because you had people that were getting married and then remarried and and, 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 and divorced multiple times. The, the most numerous of papyrus uh, uh, discoveries in Pompeii was uh, divorce records. Now, the papyrus, when I say papyrus, that was what they wrote on. So, uh, of all of the documents they found, divorce records were the most numerous. So, people were getting divorced like crazy. And now you have people who are going, so what should we do now? And Paul says, to the unmarried. If, you, if you're struggling with the desire to get married, and, and sexual temptation especially, get married. It's not a sin, he says in verse 8. So I think that's pretty clear in this text. Also, notice how he gives allowance for divorce here. Nor He, he gives allowance for divorce, but he doesn't command it. Notice that. He doesn't command divorce. He gives allowance for it, but he doesn't command it. I believe uh, he's also dealing with people who are a new creation. First Corinthians, or 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone, the new is here. There's one uh, uh, part of this text that I didn't deal with last week. There was so much that we went over. Verse 12 of chapter 7 of 1 Corinthians, he says, To the rest I say, I not the Lord. When I read that, I go, what? Why does he say that? Why does he say, I not the Lord? Is he saying that, okay, this is just me speaking, this is just my opinion, and this isn't the Lord's? 
what? That doesn't go along with what we know about Scripture. It's all God-breathed. It's given to us, inspired from the Lord himself. And I studied into that a little bit this week and found that what he's saying here is he's saying, Jesus didn't deal with this topic, the Lord Jesus. I'm dealing with this topic, the topic of those who have been remarried, divorced, remarried, and then came to know Christ and are now finding themselves stuck. Or, or they are married to someone who's an unbeliever. Saying, this is what I'm dealing with. Jesus didn't deal with that because the church had not started yet. Jesus was talking to the Jews, and he dealt with something different. In fact, in verse 10, he says, To the married I give this charge, not I, but the Lord, the wife should not separate from her husband. So if she separates, then she should remain unmarried, he says, or else be reconciled to her husband, and that's what Jesus taught. So let's go to what Jesus teaches on divorce. The one who gets divorced, the one who separates. How does Jesus address this topic? So we've got a couple passages here. Matthew chapter 19, 1 through 11 is our first text that we're going to deal with. Now, Matthew chapter 19, verses 1 through 11, is the most extensive of all of the passages on the topic of divorce that Jesus deals with. The other two, Mark and Luke, are very, very similar. In fact, Mark is definitely the same situation. He writes a little different about it. Luke is is probably the same situation, maybe a different situation. Not totally sure on that, and there's a lot of debate on that um, amongst scholars and commentators. Matthew 19, verses 1 through 11. So I hope you can turn there with me this morning. Now when Jesus had finished these sayings, he went away from Galilee and entered the region of Judea, beyond the Jordan, and large crowds followed him, and he healed them there, and Pharisees came up to him and tested him by asking, Is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? He answered, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female, and said, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh, so they are no longer two but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate." They said to him, Why then did Moses command one to give a certificate of divorce and to send her away? He said to them, Because of your hardness of heart, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. Turn with me to then Mark chapter 10, verse 1 through 12, chapter 10, verse 1 through 12. And he left there and went to the region of Judea and beyond the Jordan, and crowds gathered to him again, and again, as was his custom, he taught them. And Pharisees came up in order to test him and asked, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? He answered them, What did Moses command you? They said, Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of divorce and to send her away. And Jesus said to them, Because of your hardness of heart, He wrote you this commandment, but from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother, hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. And in the house, the disciples asked him again about this matter. And he said to them, whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. Going on to the last text, the shortest one, Luke 16, verse 18. This is Jesus just teaching on this topic. Everyone who divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery, and he who marries a woman divorced from her husband commits adultery. So, Jesus didn't play around with marriage. I don't know if you noticed that. Um, This is a serious deal. Why is there so much difference there? There's a lot of similarities, but there's some difference as well. I tend to lean towards, in chapter 16 of Luke, Jesus is teaching on this, and it's a different situation. The Pharisees aren't questioning him. could be that Luke just left that out, that the Pharisees questioned him. He just quickly recorded what Jesus taught on it. But I, I tend to think that he had already taught on this, and that's why the Pharisees came to test him. 
because they knew the views of the time. There were two very popular views that we're going to get to in a little bit, and they were testing him because they wanted to put Jesus on the spot. They knew that he was extremely conservative on this, and they knew that nobody was conservative on this issue. Everybody was very liberal. And so they were going to put him to the test, and, and that's why they asked him this question. Now, what we have here is what you would call the synoptic problem. Synoptic meaning comprehensive or, or, or it, it fits together. The synoptic gospels are Matthew, Mark, and Luke. John is a little separate because John is more theological and doesn't match with Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, it appears that there's a lot of oral tradition, a lot of oral uh, teachings that Jesus taught that they memorize, and so that's why when you read through Matthew, Mark, and Luke, it's almost exactly the same in some parts, but there's differences. And so you go, okay, what, what's with the differences? Why does Mark not mention that exception clause? You notice that's the main thing missing. In Matthew, Jesus says, except for sexual immorality, and marries another, commits adultery. So he says that, except for sexual immorality, and marries another, commits adultery. Mark doesn't deal with that. Why? There's a lot of debate on that. If you want to get more into that, you can read the paper that I wrote. I have it on the back desk. We're not going to get all the particulars, but... Really, what I see is is a comprehensive view when you have someone viewing an accident, for example. Car accident. Big deal. You want to remember all the details. You have some people that see it a certain way and other people see it another way. Some people, they they saw all that this person saw, but they're going to focus on other details and this person's going to focus on on other details. There's a um, perspective from commentators that Mark and Luke since they were written earlier and Matthew was written later, Mark and Luke don't include sexual immorality because it was a non-issue. That was just assumed. Both of the Jewish views, and like I said, we're going to get to that in a little bit, both of the the Jewish views, there's two different schools of teaching on this at the time. Both of them believe that, yes, you can get married for sexual immorality, of course. So Mark and Luke, some believe that they didn't include that because it it was just assumed, and Jesus taught that. Matthew included it because it's written later, and being written later, what do people do when they hear a new teaching? Sometimes they pendulum swing way over here to like asceticism, for example. Like the early church fathers, the first couple hundred years of the church, didn't think you could get remarried for any reason whatsoever. They were very ascetic, which means denial of the flesh, denial of all pleasure whatsoever. All pleasure was bad, and we just follow the Lord, and we don't, we don't worry about what we might feel like at all, ever. So there was more of an asceticism that was starting to become popular, and Matthew makes sure that he includes that phrase, except for sexual immorality. Whatever the case, we have a three-chord strand that is strong and not easily broken is what I say. Um, It's a three-chord strand that is strong. It's Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and we get all the details that we need. So, whatever the case, Matthew includes a part that we need to recognize. And that's what we're going to focus on mostly this morning. What is, why did Jesus give this exception clause? And what's this issue of Jesus and Moses? Why did Moses teach that someone could just give their wife a certificate of divorce and let her leave? If you go back to Deuteronomy 24, chapters one, verses 1 through 4, it's actually trying to protect the woman and mainly to protect God's reputation amongst all of the pagan nations that they live in, that they, that they live amongst. It's the law. He's saying, listen, don't defile the land. Don't defile my name. And if you, if you have a wife and you have a hardness of heart towards her and you see something indecent, you have to go through a legal process. You can't just kick her out of the house and, and treat her badly or abuse her. You have to go through a legal process. And if her, her next husband doesn't like her, you can't just take her back because she, you know, all of a sudden now you've changed your mind. It's like this woman's passed around like a, like a pawn almost. Some believe that the reason why that's in there is because it, in chapter 24 of Deuteronomy, he talks about if her husband dies, 
then you can't just you can't just go and remarry her after her husband dies. Why would you want to do that? Why would a man want to do that? Probably because she inherited all the money from that guy, and now you want to get all that money, right? So it's a protection of the woman in chapter 24 of Deuteronomy. And Jesus says, listen, Moses only allowed for that because of your hardness of heart. And by the way, church, this would, would, um, would apply to a lot of the laws in the Old Testament that deal with the broken world that we live in and the issue of sin, like laws on slavery. Jesus goes back to the beginning. It's, like, it's not supposed to be this way. Your hardness of heart was so bad that you had to have all these specific laws to deal with the problems in your society and the broken world that you live in. And that's what Jesus is talking about here. So Jesus explains this teaching of Moses and he helps his audience understand why that was even written. Now, let's get into Jesus and his audience couple things Jesus is doing here. One, most importantly, that he did throughout the, his ministry, you see it in the Sermon on the Mount in a big way, he is breaking them down with the heart of the law. He's smashing these self-righteous people down with the heart of the law. They thought they were righteous. We just can give our wife a certificate of divorce and get remarried to this woman over here. She burnt the toast. I don't like her anymore. She made my sandwich not the way I like it. Whatever the case was, they just got divorced, and then they went after this woman over here. And they thought they were totally right because that's what Moses said. And Jesus is like, no, 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 no. You're committing adultery. These statements that Jesus said is why he got crucified. That's why he got crucified. you imagine? These are self-righteous people. Their whole identity is in how well they follow the law. And Jesus calls them an adulteress. The worst thing that you can do was to commit adultery. In fact, it deserved death under the Mosaic law. And Jesus just said, you're a bunch of adulterers. Wow. He is smashing them down with the heart of the law. Going back to the beginning design of marriage. Beginning and design of marriage is that two become one flesh. And what God puts together, let no man separate. You have perverted the laws of God, and you're using it for your own sinful desires. Second, their whole purpose, their whole purpose for getting divorced was for what? Remarriage. That's why they were getting divorced. So that's the audience he's speaking to. Their whole purpose was for getting remarried. Now, why do I say that? Because there's a, some people, pastors, people that I love, friends of mine, that think that Jesus is really just saying that someone can get divorced, but he's not giving them permission to get remarried. The more ascetic view today would be once you're married, there's one covenant, that's it. If, you, if your partner leaves you, commits adultery against you, it doesn't matter what they do, you cannot get remarried. And I'm well aware that pastors in the past in this church believe that way. So I know that I believe differently from them, and I want to explain this text in the way that I see it, in the way that I see what Jesus is saying here. Now, I will say this. I respect those men. I respect people who have a strong conviction a certain way, and, and it's very hard for them to live that out today. I know as, I know, I can't imagine being a pastor and believing that and having to stand by it and then not marry people who are in a very tough spot in their life. So I do respect their courage while I disagree with their view. Their whole purpose, Jesus' audience, so remember that, Jesus' audience, their whole purpose was for getting remarried. Now, this is the key part of this study in Matthew 19. Two Jewish views, there were two Jewish views of Deuteronomy 24.1. If you go into any good commentary, they're going to bring out these views and talk about these two views. There was the Hillelite view, which they interpreted the word indecency from 24.1 of Deuteronomy. That word indecency, if you find anything indecent in your wife, send her away. They interpreted that as anything, anything whatsoever, any indecency, like burning the toast, anything. You don't like her? Just send her away. 
you know? And then there was the other view that was the more conservative view, the Shimamite view, and they interpreted indecency as referring only to adultery. This was the less popular view, especially in Jerusalem, especially in the big cities. That was what those rednecks out on the sticks, the shepherds and the, you know, the farmers, that's what they believed because they had a hard life and they needed to work through it. With, with, the divorce was expensive and they had to work, work it out. They couldn't just get divorced and remarried. It would cost them a lot of money. And so it's just those poor people out in the sticks that had that view. And nobody really takes that view seriously. And Jesus, which makes you wonder, maybe this is one of the reasons why I like Shepherd so much. Jesus sides with the Shimamite view here. I think about today in America, I think about how we have made it easy for people to get divorced. Especially those who are in poverty. In fact, sometimes people get reward, rewarded with more government help. And if you look back through the history, the time when those who were in poverty got worse was during that time. It became easier to get divorced. And it became acceptable to get divorced easily. And there were rewards for that. And you wonder why we have such a problem with poverty. You wonder why we have such a problem with absent fathers. I mean, this is devastating to have this view that you can just easily get divorced. It's a devastating issue in our culture today. And Christ sides with the most conservative view at the time. Notice the disciples' shock Disciples said to him, if such is the case of a man with his wife, it is better not to marry. Like, are you serious, Jesus? They haven't even thought of this. They've taken the popular view. Like, they're completely shocked. So Jesus holds up the covenant of marriage, but he gives that exception clause, except for sexual immorality. Church, I don't see how you can see that any differently. It is crystal clear that Jesus is allowing for remarriage after adultery. Why? It's clear because the immediate context makes it clear. Notice how he says that very verse, and marries another, commits adultery, except for sexual immorality, except for that one issue, Jesus says. Also, the cultural context would lend itself to this interpretation. Why? Because everyone was divorcing to remarry. That was the view. You get divorced because your spouse was committing adultery on you, and you can then get remarried. That's how they looked at it. That's why they were even getting divorced in the first place. Jesus would not have, I really believe that Jesus would not have included that exceptional clause if he didn't mean that they could get remarried and that there was nothing wrong with that. As Paul says, it is not a sin. Now, church, why is this important? Because sexual immorality is such a big deal in Scripture. We have, in our culture, we have dumbed down that. Like, it's not that big of a deal. It is a huge deal. This word pornea is what he is using here in Matthew. Jesus used the word, the Greek word pornea, which means sexual immorality. And inside of marriage, that was adultery. Any kind of sexual immorality inside of marriage was adultery. So some translations will translate as adultery. Most of them just translate it word for word as sexual immorality. Adultery brought about the greatest consequences of the Old Testament penal system. It was a big deal. God even divorces Israel for adultery in Jeremiah 3.8. So it's obviously okay in that instance for divorce if God can do it. Our postmodern, another reason, our postmodern culture has dumbed down the, the grotesqueness of sexual immorality so much that it has become commonplace. That we're like, well, that's not that big of a, of a deal, is it? I mean, really? No, it's a huge deal. It is a destruction of the marriage covenant. 
And God sees it that way. The marriage covenant was, was the very beginning of humanity. It was such a big deal that, that sexual morality outside of marriage, adultery, is a destruction of the marriage covenant itself. And it is a big deal to God. And so he gave that exception clause. Now notice what the disciples said. Not everyone can receive this saying. Or no, sorry, that's what Jesus said. The disciples are like, it's better not to marry. And Jesus said, not everyone can receive this saying, but only, what, to those whom it is given. That's just classic Jesus. He who has an ear, let him hear. Those who are humble, who want me, who want to trust in me and not lean on their own understanding, who want to say, Lord, what do you want and not what does my culture want? Those are the ones that are going to hear this. Not everybody's going to understand this or hear this. That's what Jesus is saying. St. Teresa of Avila said this. I got this in my devotional this last week. I thought it was really good. Explained how God drawing us is similar to a sunflower. Sunflower that when the sun starts to, to come out onto the earth in the morning and that sun hits that flower, that flower then turns towards the sun and opens up. I love that picture because that is what God does to us. He draws us to himself and those he draws to himself, we turn towards him and we open up and we say, Lord, take my heart. Like, what do you want? What do you want from me? And so that's why Jesus says this. Lastly, I'd like to address the issue of abuse because that always comes up. So Scripture deals with, clearly, in 1 Corinthians 7, abandonment. Those who are not believers, abandoning their spouse who's a believer, it deals with that. It deals with those who, who weren't believers, maybe had a history of a lot of divorce, become a believer, and now they're a new creation, it deals with that in 1 Corinthians 7. Jesus deals with adultery. That's the issue he deals with. So what do you do with abuse? I struggle, I've always struggled with this one because the, the word does not address this crystal clear. It's not crystal clear, authoritative from God's word. Similar to other issues, by the way, like drugs, cocaine, or marijuana. What you have to do is you have to take a principle over here and then apply it across to extreme drugs. I always take alcohol. Don't get drunk with wine, so don't, get, don't change your mind with drugs. Like, it leads to bad things. So I always kind of take that principle, even though it doesn't specifically say drugs, and people today have tried to say, well, the Bible doesn't say anything about it, so it's no big deal. So what do you do in issues of, of, of abuse? I just want to make some observations. I want to be careful that I'm not saying something that's not in Scripture, like it's perfectly fine to get, to get divorced in this situation, I'm just going to give some observations, and I think probably the best thing for someone who is in an abusive situation is to share these observations with them, tell them to take them to the Lord and pray about them, and then um, pray for them, okay? My first observation is, what about 1 Corinthians 7.10? What do you do with 1 Corinthians 7.10? What does it say in that passage? The wife should not separate from the husband. Now, if you were to take that one verse, rip it out of context, and apply it to abuse, it would be a really, really dangerous thing to do. If, if, if that's what people do, then every pastor I know is giving ungodly advice because every pastor I know, when, they're, when a wife is being abused by her husband, he says, separate. First thing he says, separate, get safe, get the kids safe, right? So it would go against every godly advice I know, and it also put women in a very dangerous position or there is something more going on here and I believe it is if you read 1 Corinthians 7 in its entirety you realize that Paul is talking about women whose husbands still pagan maybe still going to the temple with prostitutes for all we know I mean he's he's literally saying like you guys work it out don't just automatically separate because they don't know the Lord, because they could come to know the Lord through you, through your good conduct. So that is not what Paul is talking about in 1 Corinthians 7. He's not talking about abuse. You can't apply that phrase, the wife should not separate from her husband, across to abuse. It's not the same situation. Second observation, Jesus consistently looked past the letter of the law to the heart 
of the law, why it was written. For example, working on the Sabbath. Jesus worked on the Sabbath and he got in trouble for it because he was doing it for God's glory. He was healing people. They had taken that letter of the law to its extreme and Jesus always looked at the heart of the law. Third, Jesus deals with the sin issue of his audience in Matthew 19. In Matthew 19. So he's, he's dealing with men who are, who are divorcing their wife because their wife has just annoyed them in some way. That's what he's dealing with. And he says only for sexual immorality. So... You've got to look at Jesus' audience and what he's dealing with there. Fourth, Paul takes it a step further. Paul takes what Jesus said. Notice in chapter 7, he says, The Lord, not I, said this. Now I am taking that principle a step forward and saying, Okay, in this instance, it's a different situation, so we're going to apply the principle to this different situation. Now, That is just an observation. What should we do with the principles that are taught on marriage and divorce in Scripture? Fifth, beating one's wife is the antithesis of the marriage covenant. What is the marriage covenant? Ephesians 5, 29. Husbands, love your wives like Christ loved the church. Beating someone's wife, abusive, is is the antithesis of that marriage covenant. Exodus 21, 10 through 11 talks about how a husband is supposed to take care of his wife, provide for her, and, 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 and cherish her. But rather, um, beating one's wife is the exact opposite of that, clearly. Last observation, and this is one that, that you have to be careful with, opening the door for divorce and abuse can lead to a slippery slope. It can lead to a slippery slope. What do I mean by that? Well, my husband yelled at me, you know, he's verbally abusive, I'm going to get a divorce. And I can, because I'm taking the principle of Scripture and applying it, and they start, you see how we can easily do what the Pharisees did? Like, it's easy for us in our sinful nature to, to, to take a principle and then apply it so we can get what we want. And that's not what this is saying, and it's very dangerous to do, to do that. Where do you draw the line? Oh, such a tough one here, such a tough one here. Dr. Craig Keener said this, the believer is, this, his, his view is more divorce, only abuse, sexual immorality, and abandonment. That, those are his views. Um, he says, the believer is not to break up the marriage, but only to accept that the unrepentant partner has irreparably broken it. And when there is someone who is consistently abusive, maybe giving drugs to children, tough situations like that, destroying the family finances, the marriage covenant is being destroyed pretty, pretty severely. Now, notice this though, church. Jesus never commanded divorce. He never commanded it. He permitted for it, from what I see clearly in Scripture, but He never commanded it. Paul never commanded divorce. There should always be the desire for reconciliation and redemption. And if you are in a marriage where one spouse had committed sexual immorality and you forgave them and worked through that, what a beautiful picture that is to a broken world. What a beautiful picture of forgiveness that is hard to do, and yet you forgave. And maybe you're sitting here and you're like, I did that. Be thankful that God gave you someone that was Jesus to you. Be thankful for that. Praise Him for that. And let that draw you even closer together as you've heard all of this. Realize that that God is always about reconciliation and redemption and restored relationships. So make sure that no matter what, no matter what situation, if you're counseling, so maybe you're you're thinking, these are none of me, like this doesn't apply to me. My encouragement to you is to know what the Scriptures say on this so that you're ready to give counsel to people when it comes up. Because it, there are many times where it comes up and people usually just tell the person to do what they want to hear. 
Be ready with Scripture to share with someone and counsel them in the right direction. And do so with humility, realizing that, that, that Jesus dealt most harshly with those who were willing to judge everyone else's situation and never looked at their own issues. So remember that as well. Jesus was most harsh with us, and that's why he is so intense here on this issue of divorce and remarriage. Now, if you're in a tough place or just want some growth in your marriage relationship, I want to encourage you, like, we are here. This church is here to counsel if there's ever a need. We've seen marriages restored. We've seen marriages that were on the verge of divorce restored and, and in a real healthy place. And I just praise God for that. To a watching world, that is huge. That is the light that this world needs so badly. I mean, I've heard that it, the divorce rate is the same inside the church that it is outside the church. I don't know if that considers just every Christian that calls themselves a Christian. I run across people all the time that say they're Christian, and I know they don't even go to church, right? So I don't know if that's like Anybody just claims Christ. But from what I have seen in every church I have been in, it is way, way lower. And I am so thankful for that. To me, that shows that the church is being the light that God has called her to be. So let's make sure that that stays that way. That we fight for our marriages. That we, that we work through the toughest of situations for the glory of God. And we realize that that person God has put in our lives so that we would love them well. And we fight to the bitter end for that relationship. Above all other relationships out there. So I want to encourage you to think that way for the glory of our Lord. This is a lot of head knowledge stuff I know this morning. Um, I hope that it's helpful to you and gives you clarity on some of these issues. But maybe you were shocked on either end of it. Maybe you thought it was okay to get divorced easily for any, like that's not that big of a deal if you just don't, you're not getting along and our personalities don't match or, 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 you know, it just isn't working and I'm just not happy, right? Like that's like the American way. I'm just not happy. It just doesn't make me happy. Remember, you're to pursue holiness and happiness comes. True happiness, true joy, true contentment. Pursue holiness first. Maybe that's you. Maybe you, you're under the mindset that you can't ever get remarried if you've been divorced for any reason. I want to encourage you. Look at that text and what it's saying. Maybe if you need to get my paper, you're, you're wrestling with this. This is new to you. Get that paper. Study it. Don't just study one view. Study all the views. Look at what the Scripture says. And be careful that you are not being... Maybe you don't even want to be self-righteous. Maybe you just want to handle the word correctly, but it can come across very jaded towards people who have been through a very, very tough thing in their lives. And they've had that covenant broken, and they've been severely hurt. And God gives grace and a way out. And lastly, I'd just like to say this. If you have been into an abusive situation or your spouse committed adultery on you, I want to encourage you that it, the solving of that issue doesn't come, the hurt that you're dealing with doesn't come first to finding the next person. The healing occurs from going to the Lord Jesus and letting him heal you. I saw a close person in my life, doesn't live in this town or anything, so I know I can share this close person in my life who was severely beaten, had her husband hold a gun to her head, she stuck with him for a long time. She would separate for a while. She'd get back together. Eventually, it ended up in divorce for her own safety. And she ended up remarrying, like, right after that, married another guy who did the exact same thing. My heart broke for her. I mean, I was just so hoping that this guy would treat her right. I don't know what all, why she married, married this guy or what, what the issue was. But I just, I just share that because sometimes people are so quick to just get married quickly again because it's like it's, there's some healing there and it's like I'm vindicated and I, I just want to encourage you. Your vindication comes from the King of Kings and not from any person. Not from any person. So go to Jesus for healing. First and foremost in any relationship, it is not solved by another person. 
And I want to show you a video. We're going to show one last video. I told you we're going to go along today. This video is our marriage um, and family and just even singles counseling video. And if you're struggling and you need some counsel, even some marriage counsel, we want to be here for you. So watch this real quick. Hi, my name is Gary Mosley. And I want to take this opportunity to share with you a new ministry of our church. We are excited to announce that Riverside is now offering biblical counseling for those of our church and in our community. Our mission is to provide biblical solutions for the problems people face in their lives. This service will be free of charge and will be provided by Pastor Han and three others that are trained in biblical counseling. Myself, Demario Phillips, and Mindy Mosley. The three of us are pursuing certification with the Association of Certified Biblical Counselors. Biblical counseling should be viewed as discipleship in the Word of God, the Bible, on a specific issue of life such as marriage, depression, anger, fear, or any other area that you may be struggling with. Here at Riverside, we believe in the sufficiency of Scripture. The Apostle Paul wrote in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, all scripture is inspired by God and beneficial for teaching, for rebuke, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man or woman of God may be fully capable, equipped for every good work. To schedule an appointment for biblical counseling, please contact the church at the number below. Thank you and God bless. And as we continue to worship, we're going to sing one more song. It's called Christ Be Magnified. So let's go ahead and stand as we sing that song. Be magnified. 
to idols, I'll stand strong and worship you. And if it puts me in the fire, I'll rejoice cause you're there too. I won't be formed by feelings, I hold fast to what is true. If the cross brings transformation, then I'll be crucified with you. Cause death is just the doorway into resurrection life. If I join you in your sufferings, then I'll join you when you rise. And then you return in glory with all the angels and the saints. My heart will still be singing. My soul will be the same. Oh, Christ be magnified. Let His praise arise. Christ be magnified in me. Oh, Christ be magnified from the altar of my life. Christ be magnified in me. Oh, Christ be magnified. Let His praise arise. Christ be magnified. And as we conclude our service this, this morning, I want to make a special announcement. Um, Anita Gifford is stepping down as our pianist here at Riverside. So this is going to be our last Sunday playing the piano for us. Um, we have, Anita, you spent so many years here sharing, sharing your gifts and talents with us, and, and we're so appreciative of, of, all the, of all that you've done for us. And so as a token of our appreciation, we have this a small gift. And Sheila, if you want to bring it back. Here you go, Anita. Thank you so much, Anita. We, we sure appreciate you. Thank you, Anita. We really appreciate you. So with that, we are concluded with the service, so you guys are dismissed. Thank you. <laughs>